So, um, what is deviance? Um, well, you know, deviance is just a word that means deviating from a norm. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, um, there's an expectation of how you should behave, and then people deviate from that norm. They don't adhere to the norm. And certain kinds of deviance are meaningful, and certain kinds of deviance are not meaningful. So, you know, I'm sitting here in front of you, and I could do something like this, right? Which is like a weird way of me moving my body. And that's a form of deviance from the norm of what's expect expected in terms of how I move my hands. And it's not really a meaningful um, uh, expression of deviance. Um, and sometimes deviance from a norm um, doesn't actually reflect much socially meaningful because what it really reflects is like mental illness, for example. Like the person who's deviating from the norm is expressing a kind of um, mental illness or incapacity to recognize um, social life uh, and, and our expectations of it. Um, uh, instead, today we'll be kind of interested in deviance from the norm that is socially meaningful deviance from the norm. So it's something where, you know, um, the, the uh, the, the deviance from the norm or the refusal to in, engage with the norm um, has a social meaning to it. And sometimes this means that the deviance is part of a community of people who are deviant or um, that it is an active um, choice to not engage with the norm or that the deviance reflects some kind of social pattern. And, you know, how we understand uh, deviance, um, that is normative versus deviant behavior, is a really complicated issue in sociology and people have very different perspectives within it. Um, and for you know, now, what I would, I'm gonna present to you are different approaches to understanding this. So this should be kind of a consistent theme for you guys every lecture. It's sort of like I give you multiple different perspectives on the same object. And then we kind of think through um, some of the implications of that. So um, uh, uh, with that, I wanted to return to, I showed a graph, this graph in another um, uh, uh, one of these lectures. Um, uh, and um, I uh, wanted to kind of return to it uh, because this, gives us a sense of how what constitutes deviant behavior could change over time, um, by which I mean that the same behavior could at one period in time be read as deviant and another period of time be read as normative or acceptable. So, you know, behaviors that violate social norms may not be constant in our interpretation of them. And context really matters here. That is the situation that is helping define um, uh, um, this experience or moment really, really matters. So, um, you know, there's a series of questions about do you support Black Lives Matter, um, the movement of Black Lives Matter. And what this shows is that from, you know, May um, of last year uh, until, uh, I mean, May of uh, 2018, uh, 2017, until about January of 2018, half of the people did not support the movement. Um, so, um, you know, this is uh, fewer than five, like five, it's basically 55% do not support and 45% support. But then if you move forward to the right tail of this graph, you see that in kind of May and June and of this recent year, there's a huge swing of support for the movement. And so, you know, the definition of deviance is something that's pretty straightforward. It refers to behaviors that violate social norms. So deviance is behaviors or are behaviors that violate social norms. And often these norm violations are met with sanctions. Um, but what constitutes a normative expectation may change over time. 
Um, so an example of this also could be um, same-sex marriage uh, throughout much of the world, which, is a full, which was for some time, period of time deviance, deviance from an acceptable social norm, but that now in many places is actually accepted. And so what makes something deviant is not the behavior, it's the, it's the norm. Um, so behaviors aren't inherently deviant, it's whether or not they are violating a norm. And as our norms change, our definitions of deviance change. So the Black Lives Matter movement for a lot of people um, was seen as an illegitimate movement for a period of time. And then it transformed into something that was seen as increasingly legitimate. So the norm, the expectation of acceptable forms of protest and protesters shifted so that what in one period may have been a deviant action to be engaging in a protest in a second moment could be a normative one. We see this again and again and again. It doesn't happen so often that like the world is constantly in turmoil that we don't realize what is normative and what isn't. But if you think about like different kinds of clothing, which might at one point in time be seen as deviant and then later be totally normatively acceptable. Um, if we think about other kinds of behaviors, like I said, with same-sex marriage, um, we see how deviance can be flipped to be normative, not because the behavior has changed, but because the norm has changed or the expectation for how we should act has been changing. So norms, um, we, can, we think of in three ways, folkways, mores, and laws. Um, folkways are kind of the least serious set of norms. They're the most casual ones. They can be humorous or silly, and they're typically linked to custom or tradition. So um, these are things that like, aren't very aggressively policed, um, uh, but they're things that like, you know, we just kind of tend to do. And so violations of folk traditions aren't typically seen as massive violations of expectations for actions. Mores, by contrast, are more codified than um, uh, folkways, and they're typically more seriously policed. These are things like morals and values and a sense of right and wrong within a community. And it's not necessarily the case, in fact, with mores, it's usually not the case that those moral commitments are, um, uh, that there are rules about them, but they're just kind of like things that you don't do. Um, and the, to do them is seen as, as breaking a moral commitment to the community. So, you know, the distinction between folkways and mores is partially that like, Mores is like, this is a deeply held moral commitment that we have. And folkways is more of like, this is just something we kind of do most of the time. If you don't do it, like, well, you know, it's kind of disappointing, but it, it's not like it's a moral violation. Laws are the most serious and codified. They're literally written down. And so norms exist of many types. Some are customs or tradition. Um, you know, we just tend to do this kind of thing as a community. Um, so like uh, uh, in the United States, like people tend to eat turkey on Thanksgiving. And you know, the, that's like a folk way. It's like a folk tradition or custom. And if you don't do it, it's weird, but it's not like you violated a deep moral expectation of what it is to be a human being. Um, you know, many people in fact don't eat turkey either because they're vegetarians or they think it's gross or, um, you know, they have a different tradition within their own family or community. Mores have a stronger commitment to them. So these are things where it actually is a moral violation to a community. And then laws are things that are written down that we have our greatest commitment to. Social control um, is the idea that societies influence people's behavior in two ways. One, um, that's sort of a subtle driving of behavior. And then the other is a much more direct driving of behavior. 
So um, a subtle driving of behavior is just sort of like um, closer to the kind of um, folkways and mores that we saw where you know, families, um, communities say, this is who we are, this is how we act, and we're gonna drive your behavior through that. Direct driving of behavior is typically codified in law. And it says like, you actually have to act this way or we're gonna punish you. We may punish you quite severely. Social control is something that all societies practice or engage in. So every single society out there has a way of policing social control. And policing, I use as a word there, doesn't mean necessarily like the actual police, so people whose job it is to be police, but there are lots of forms of policing that we engage in. And those forms of policing could be things like, um, you know, if you and I are going to a friend's wedding and you're dressed in jeans and a t-shirt, I may say to you, are you really gonna wear that to our friend's wedding? Like don't you want to wear something a little bit nicer, like a nicer outfit? That is my policing your behavior, right? So there are many ways in which societies engage in the policing of their members. This is something that all of us do. We, you know, um, make some judgments about whether or not people's behaviors adhere to our social norms. And then on the basis of those judgments, we sometimes engage in sanctions, either really strong sanctions or really weak sanctions. So in the example that I just gave of the wedding, I could say, I'm not going to the wedding with you. Like, I'm literally not going to travel with you to this wedding because the way that you're dressed is so disrespectful to our friend getting married that I find this offensive and I will not go with you. That's a sanction. It could be a sanction, especially if, say, I'm driving us to the wedding. And then that's different than you know, um, other forms of sanctions, which may involve the actual police, the people whose profession it is. One of the ways in which um, societies engage in the strongest form of, of social control, I shouldn't say strongest, one, of, one major way that societies engage in social control is through moral panics. And moral panics tend to be kind of short-lived, but very intense panics about the moral behaviors of individuals um, and uh, how it is that those behaviors are leading to the demise or collapse of society. So um, uh, many of you listening to these lectures likely are young people, I would guess, and you probably have experienced a bunch of moral panics um, uh, in, in your own lifetime. Maybe not a bunch, but a few. But like, you know, examples from uh, uh, the chapter that this lecture is based on would be, you know, Snapchat. So like when Snapchat as an online platform emerged, there was a moral panic about how it could lead to the collapse of society. Um, there have been moral panics over dating apps, you know, so the ways that young people today maybe meet each other through online media um, with dating profiles and things like that. And the moral panic there is like, these things are leading to the collapse of society. Um, there have been moral panics about other kinds of things like obesity, smoking, drinking, and how um, um, they can contribute to the utter demise of a society. Um, uh, these panics sort of, they bubble up, um, people en end up in a kind of fury, and then they, they collapse. One of the biggest moral panics that existed in my lifetime was a panic over um, uh, crack cocaine and babies, uh, crack babies. And this was um, uh, an idea that, that, that like women who were using crack cocaine, which is um, a particular form of cocaine that comes in a rock form, um, uh, that they were making when they were having children, they were forming children who were incapable of making moral decisions. So that babies born who had mothers who were addicted to crack were basically gonna turn into super criminals or super predators because they wouldn't be able to make moral decisions. This as it turns out, wasn't true at all. And in fact, um, you know, the research on 
cocaine use and children showed that it was no worse and probably actually better for children than alcohol. Um, but there was an enormous panic about this. There were like newspapers and magazines writing articles uh, about like the coming generation of young people who were gonna be massively deviant predators um, destroying um, the world uh, around us. And um, this was a, an example of a moral panic. And what that moral panic sought to do was to control the behavior of people within a community. I want to outline a range of theories uh, and perspectives for understanding deviance. Um, these theories should give us answers to the questions of why people engage in deviance and others don't. Um, and uh, how do we know when a behavior itself is deviant? And what do we do if we don't all agree? Like, what if we do if, if, if we don't agree on the deviance of a behavior? Um, I have a very strong, very strong uh, commitment to uh, academic integrity and the integrity of the work that um, my students hand in. And so if my students end up plagiarizing work, I think of that as a huge moral violation of our community, of our academic community. Other people don't share that commitment particularly those who engage in academic dishonesty. So we might ask, like, how do we know what that, whether or not that behavior is deviant and what do we do about it? And I'm gonna very strongly assert that it is a deviant behavior, but others may say, actually, nobody owns ideas. Why should we do this? This seems really silly. And we'll be in a, we'll be in a big struggle over this. We see this all the time. There are still those, um, many people across the world who do not agree with homosexuality, for example. And so um, many of us think that it's totally acceptable behaviors, others don't. And so how do we engage with this and come to understand or determine what's deviant? So the first set of th theories uh, about deviance are theories that you've encountered if you've listened to some of the other lectures, um, which are functionalist theories. And again, to remind you, functionalist theories are theories that ask, what is the social function of uh, this behavior? Um, that is, what, how is, what is it that deviance does in an almost positive sense? So previously, I, in the lecture on Durkheim, I talked about Durkheim and crime. And Durkheim argues that crime serves a social function, that crime is a normal, not a pathological social form, and that it's actually productive. It does something for us all as a community. And this is part of the functionalist theory of deviance, that it serves a social function. The deviance reminds us or tells us what's right and wrong, and it establishes boundaries between acceptable and unacceptable behaviors. And in particular, punishment is something that we do not for the deviant person, but for everybody else, for ourselves. So this is kind of what the idea looks like. Um, you know, Durkheim argued that society produces deviance. It actually generates this by generating commitments to norms. And in producing that deviance, in um, basically generating that deviance, what um, uh, 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 societies are doing is policing the boundaries of their norms. So um, if they cease to police the boundaries of the norms, the norms no longer become important and they change. There may be a new set of norms within a society that um, uh, the people are committed to. But importantly, when there is a deviant act, we as a society punish that act. And the act of punishment is partially what deviance is all about because what it does is it sort of creates a disincentive for people to deviate. But what it really does is it serves to collectively reaffirm our shared commitment to a norm. So what happens is that there is a collective shared commitment to norms that gets reasserted every time we punish deviance. So the punishment of deviance is our way of collectively reaffirming our commitment to social norms. Now, there are other theories of deviance, also some from Durkheim, anime is one of them, or strain theory. 
And a me is the idea that sometimes deviance emerges because people haven't been fully integrated into or regulated by the norms of a society. And anime is particularly interested in the experience of regulation, normative regulation. So also earlier with Durkheim, I told you about how Durkheim has this idea that we should look to how integrated people are into a group, that is what their social ties are, as well as how regulated they are to by a group, how clear it is what the normative commitments of that group are and that you should adhere to them. An anime is an experience where you don't have a sense of, or the community has not created a firm set of guidelines for behavior. So you don't really know how it is that you should act. And the experience of anime is an experience of normlessness. It's not clear what norms you should follow. Um, so sometimes you can experience anime when you enter into a new community. If you've ever like, joined a new school, for example, and it's not clear to you what the expectations for action are, you may be experiencing anime. And in that instance, what it is is that you're like, basically don't have norms to guide your behavior. And so in this case, deviance occurs when there's a mismatch between the goals and the means to achieve them between your, the goals that you have and a clear sense of what, um, uh, what it means to, to actually go about and achieve those kinds of goals. And an idea that folks who are subscribed to this theory is that enemy can cause strain, where strain has a range of adaptions to it. Um, and so, you know, strain theory thinks about conformity, innovation, ritualism, retreatism, and rebellion. Um, and so when thinking about like why it is that, um, uh, or how it is that people respond to a condition of anime, strain becomes something that's critically important as part of that response. Um, oh, what is happening? I apologize, I don't know why that just happened. Um, uh, so um, uh, let me just conclude this portion of the lecture and then um, stop. So a final theory of deviance is opportunity theory. Um, and opportunity theory is kind of offshoot of anime theory um, and strain theory. And um, uh, it, it asks why people solve their problems in one way and not the other. Um, uh, so, why is it that like, um, if my problem is that I'm hungry, um, I steal in order to solve my problem. And opportunity theory is understood as an offshoot of enemy um, or strain, building on a kind of functionalist um, uh, foundation. And what it thinks about is the idea of illegitimate means or illegitimate pathways to realizing people's ends. And um, if you've ever uh, seen the musical Les Mis or uh, uh, um, uh, read the book by Victor Hugo, you know, the very motivating uh, uh, idea behind that book is how it is that, um, uh, you know, someone steals a loaf of bread in order to feed their family. And there they engage in an act of deviance in order to solve a problem in their life. And um, the concept that that sort of play revolves around, or this trope, which we hear about a lot, like um, in our culture, there's this consistently, this, uh, this is thing that we play with in songs, in plays, in movies, about how people have some real constraint in their life and they break rules in order to get around that constraint, but that often the ways that they break those rules are illegitimate. And so it's the concept of illegitimate means. And there um, it's that the deviant's choices are constrained by their social construct, context as much as anybody else. Um, and uh, um, 
you know, uh, basically not everyone has access to deviant behavior as a kind of opportunity structure. Um, uh, and so whether or not you have access to deviant behavior is really, really important. I feel like I'm not being clear, so let me try and be um, uh, 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 clearer about this. In order to engage in deviance, one of the things that you might need is an opportunity to engage in deviance. So an opportunity to sort of not adhere to norms. And so some people, um, may be more likely than others to be exposed to deviant subcultures. And so insofar as these people are exposed to deviant subcultures, they have a greater opportunity to deviate. So, you know, think about this casually, maybe even in your own, in your own lives. Um, in many places, there's sort of a strong normative expectation that people don't smoke. And so, this has been like turned into a little bit of a moral panic about how horrible smoking is, and it's you know one of the worst things you can do. And so you might ask, like, what, what, um, you know, why is it then that people deviate from smoking? Well, one explanation is an explanation of opportunity. Like they had an opportunity to smoke, so some of their friends smoked, for example. And this provided them with an opportunity or access to deviate from the expected mode of the behavior. And we can extend this to other forms of deviance, other times where people deviate from the expected behavior. Um, so, you know, uh, think of like, if you're going to rob a store, um, right? Like one of the things that you need is an opportunity maybe other people to join you to help within that. And so um, a theory of opportunity theory of deviance is a kind of social theory of deviance where the opportunities that you're surrounded by, in some, some ways the other people who are around you could create a greater propensity to commit deviance. So I don't have a lot of people in my life who engage in robbery. And insofar as I don't have a lot of people in my life who engage in robbery, um, one of the consequences of that is that like, um, I don't have huge opportunities to steal things. But if I had more people in my life who did, um, it'd be pretty likely that I'd steal stuff, that I'd actually you know, uh, begin to take things, not because um, of anime or lack of normlessness, but because opportunities were being presented to me to do this in ways that I didn't have in other contexts. Well, what this opportunity theory helps us see is how deviance isn't just an individual level behavior. It's not just something that like me as an individual does because I haven't been fully integrated into the normative expectations of the community that I'm from, it instead happens in part because of the patterns of social influence and social context that I live with. Now, the reason this is so important and that I'm spending so much time on it is that like, this helps us understand why deviance may be patterned in particular communities. 